Thank you, Dr. Telesa. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and, and very perceptive introduction about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So it, the presentation the, the, itself uh, that my, uh, it wants to show the difference between the real paradigm shift that is embodied in the Constitution for the Federation of Earth and the current paradigm under which the United Nations and the uh, world is operating. Uh, it's very important because the argument, as Professor uh, Kalesra has uh, mentioned, is that the uh, sustainable development goals are not achievable under the current paradigm uh, that the world is operating under. Uh, and uh, so this first screen emphasizes that. Uh, you can see at the top, the sovereign nation states are based on national self-interest and are legally fractured from one another. They're legally sovereign, independent. Uh, the capitalist system is based on personal and corporate self-interest, of course nations as well as businesses and corporations competing and and trying to make a profit uh, in the market. Uh, it's not based on the common interest of humanity. Uh, the Earth Constitution, on the contrary, is is formulated, is designed for the to uh, to work for the common interest of the whole of humanity and the human dignity of each. And its design is uh, there uh, to solve our most fundamental problems. That's its intention. So it gives a peace is not just uh, an ideal that we try to strive for in our personal and corporate uh, enterprises. Peace is a system. Right? You can have a peace system or you can have a war system. And if you have 193 nations, all of which have the legal right to militarize and as much as possible and to use their military whenever they think is necessary, then that's a war system, right? So it's the same with justice. If you want equality for all human beings to want to end poverty, you have to have a justice system, not just an ideal of justice. And the third thing, of course, is sustainability. That's what the UN Sustainable Development Goals are about. If you want sustainability, it has to be the entire world system predicated on sustainability. It cannot just be an ideal that the nations strive for within a framework that is antithetical to sustainability. Okay, so uh, can you see the next slide? The next slide, is that visible now? Yeah, it's visible. Yeah, it's visible, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, so uh, the uh, Sustainable Development Go Document Goal, of course, is online. Uh, it's a very large document. Uh, and uh, it's called Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The document's introduction says that all countries and all stakeholders acting in collaborative partnership are resolved to free the human race from the tyranny of poverty and want and heal and secure our planet. Uh, so it's a universal agenda. It's a, it's a uh, purports to be a world transforming agenda, but it, as we will see, it does not. Um, it does not question the world system within which this ideal agenda has been uh, uh, proposed. So let's look at the next slide. So these are the a list of the a uh, very uh, overview list of the seventeen goals. Right? No poverty, no hunger, and this is by the year twenty thirty. That's that's ten years from now. We're already five years into the project, right? The Sustainable Development Goals are supposed to be in force for nations of the world from the year 2015 and 16 up to 2030, 15-year uh, window. We're already five 
years into this project, one third through the project, how much has changed? Do we have, are we getting closer to zero hungry or no hunger or no poverty, good health and well being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work, economic growth? Notice economic growth. That's a that's a key point that we'll need to look at as we go through. Industry innov innovation uh, directed toward uh, the sustainable development goals, reduced inequality, sustainable cities, responsible c consumption, climate action, life below water, life on land, justice, and strong institutions and partnerships to achieve the goal. But it says, even though they they uh, introduce the whole idea of the world's uh, nations being in partnership to achieve these goals, it emphasizes, as you can see at the bottom right of your screen, that each country has primary responsibility for its own economic and social development. All right. So there's a there's a there's a tension here. Is it the world joining together to create sustainability, or does each country have responsible responsibility for its own goals? Okay, the next slide is just a reminder of probably what we're all quite familiar with, but it's usually not framed. This reminder is usually not framed within the concept of failure. Right. Uh, the first UN uh, an environmental conference took place in Stockholm in 1972. At that time, in 1972, I, I was a young man in college at that time, uh, and the environmental crisis was on everybody's mind. Everybody was talking about the danger to the environment and the uh, population crisis and so on for the earth. Uh, so they knew about these problems and the seriousness of these problems in 1972, right? 20 years later, in 1992, the famous Rio de Janeiro conference in which they formulated Agenda 21, which is uh, the, the uh, goal was by the 21st century, Agenda 21, the 21st century, within eight years, the nations need to, needed to drastically reduce their carbon emissions that they're pouring into the atmosphere. So the, uh, the 92 conference recognized the failure of the Stockholm conference. By the time 20, the 21st century came, uh, the UN met again in uh, Johannesburg in 2002, 10 years later and they recognized the failure of the uh, Rio Agenda 21. Nations had not succeeded. And uh, then they formulated the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, uh, which were enforced from the year 2000 to the 2015. And those Millennium Development Goals emphasized the need to reduce carbon emissions and, and convert the world from fossil fuel burning to uh, clean sources of energy. And the year 2015 came and went, and again, they recognized failure, total failure, right? Some nations made a little bit of progress here or there, but the world itself producing immense amounts of, of uh, carbon and methane and putting them into the atmosphere, heating up the planet uh, through the process of global warming, uh, none of that was was reduced and uh so they formulated the sustainable development goals and the argument given by the un was that the millennium development goals which had failed were not sufficiently detailed or elaborated enough that the millennium development goals left out for example getting rid of poverty getting rid of hunger and so on uh, so the argument was that it needs to be a comprehensive world uh, vision. And so the sustainable development goals are much more detailed, much more comprehensive than the Millennium Development Goals were. 
However, they leave out precisely the transformation of the rest of the world system. It can't be just nations having these ideal goals, no matter how elaborate they are. You've got to look at the world system, the economic and political system of the world that is supposed to be there as an infrastructure for achieving these goals. Uh, they have not done that. And uh, so we have a history of failure in the first five years of the SDGs that we now, as we enter the year 2021, the nations have not made sufficient, significant progress toward achieving these goals. So uh, let us look at the next slide. Uh, so we have, uh, just as a reminder uh, for all of us, sea levels are rising and computer modeling uh which is being done by the uh, thousands of scientists around the world in the intergovernmental panel on climate change and so on computer modeling shows that these the, that the uh it's inevitable that many of the coastal cities of the world cities with with 10 15 million people are are going to be in danger submerged so what are we going to do with all these people? We're going to have to relocate these cities and all the people that live in them. The oceans are warming and acidifying. And it's uh, since the uh, 1970s and 80s, the global fisheries have been declining, right? Fish populations have been declining. Fisheries are dying. A third of the world's population uses fish as part of their diet and uh, uh, serious, serious problem. And the same with number three, there's massive degradation and disappearing of agricultural lands. Well, partly because of over uh, cr cropping them and over grazing them and so on. The, the, uh, the, the need for food is increasing in the world because the population of the world is increasing, but the amount of fisheries and the amount of agricultural lands available to produce that food is is not sufficient. So the the food is planted more often. It's tried to the the productivity is intensified on it, which ultimately degrades the ability of the of the land to uh, sustainably uh, keep producing food. Uh, so number four, heat is increasing everywhere on the planet and computer uh, um, uh, projections uh, uh, tell us that by the end of the 21st century, there will be places on this planet that are literally uninhabitable. People will have to go outdoors. People will have to wear something like spacesuits because they, the temperature will not be something that can sustain a, a living human creature. Uh, number five, uh, there is an in, uh, unprecedented spread of insects and pests and diseases. Uh, the uh, pine bark beetle is destroying millions of acres of uh, trees in North America. And the reason why it's destroying these trees and it's out of control is because the winters are not as severe as they were 20 or 30 years ago and it was the coldness of the winters that kept that that creature in check. So as the winters get milder, the creature spreads more and more into the northern forests and so on. The same with mosquitoes and malaria. Mosquitoes are now found in many places of the world where they weren't previously found because of the cold weather and uh, the diseases that they carry uh, and so on. And, and this is true, generally speaking. Number six, massive species extinctions. And uh, uh, we're in the sixth, as uh, the scientists say, where they call it, we're in the sixth great extinction period. Throughout human history, all these uh, umpteen millions of years, uh, uh, 3.6 billion years since life started, we've had three, six great extinctions. We're in the sixth one now. And, but the sixth one is anthropogenic. It's, it's caused by human beings. Uh, number seven, wildfires. As uh, the news tells us, 
the western United States, millions of acres of uh, trees and brush destroyed by wildfires. Throughout Australia, wildfires destroying, and even in uh, the lungs of the earth in, in Brazil, wildfires, uh, fires catching out of control because the world is drying up. The rainfall patterns are changing and uh, the, the vegetation is more susceptible to wildfires. And then superstorms, right? The storm last year in Bangladesh that was so devastating to that country. The storms uh, that have been, uh, that hit New Orleans and destroyed the city of New Orleans uh, a few years ago and so on. Well, all of these things, uh, all of these things have a synergistic effect. They're not just isolated phenomena. They're part of a general climate crisis, right? And they, so the world is in very dire straits, right? It does not look good for the future of humanity. And the question is whether these sustainable development goals are going to be able to be achieved under the current world system, uh, are we really going to have a future for humanity under these goals? And so the world system, is, uh, as presupposed by the United uh, Nations, is, is the world system that, that has colonized uh, uh, every place on the planet uh, for the last three centuries, right? Uh, capitalism, uh, began three uh, in the Renaissance, actually five centuries ago, and has has evolved. But it is the dominant economic system now, penetrating everywhere. There's no con there's no country that uh, uh, is not affected by it. Even those countries that wish to be uh, have a different system, like Cuba and Venezuela, uh, they're they're trapped within the global you know, if Venezuela wants to sell its oil on the market, uh, it has vast resources of oil. It has to use the capitalist system to sell those because there's a buying and selling that's worldwide in oil and other such resources. And and uh, but these 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 countries that try to ex ex exit themselves from the system are punished, as we know, by the system. Cuba and Venezuela are being punished by the United States, blockaded, and so on. So uh, uh, Christopher uh, Chase Dunn, a, a well-known uh, scientist, social scientist in the United States, uh, says uh, the system of unequally powerful and competing nation states is part of the competitive struggle of capitalism and thus the wars in geopolitics are a systematic part of capitalist dynamics, all right? The U.S. doesn't go to war for contingent reasons. It goes to war for economic reasons. Economic, it's, it is crushing Venezuela for economic reasons. It doesn't want socialism to exist there and so on. And the this uh, chart on the right-hand side of the slide uh, is a standard chart that comes from world systems theorists. Uh, in there's the world since the uh, 16th century, Spain in the 16th century controlled the seas. Its navy was global, and Spain was the imperial center of the world. So it, uh, you know, through its colonies and through its slavery and so on. It uh, exploited the periphery of the world and the periphery for cheap resources and cheap labor uh, and slaves and, uh, and uh, uh, colonial situations that would produce crops and, and produce wealth and send the wealth back to the imperial center. Uh, and uh, nations have struggled throughout, European nations have struggled for the the place of that imperial center france was part of the struggle and portugal and in britain but it, by the 19th century britain britain was the uh was the imperial center as we know it, it uh india bangladesh australia all over the world the sun never set on the british empire and the british empire ha had this structure to it right there were rival 
states in the semi-periphery, allies and rivals uh, uh, themselves fairly successful and fairly militarized. But the vast majority of human beings, largely in the global South, Africa, South Asia, South America, and so on, were, were there for, in an, within an economic system that exploited their poverty. Uh, to the benefit of the imperial core. And, and then uh, the world systems theorists uh, commonly agree that in uh, at the end of the Second World War, when Britain was destroyed, Britain's power and wealth were destroyed by the Second World War, uh, the new imperial center became the United States. And the United States benefits, right? Uh, uh, the shirt that I'm wearing uh, actually was given to me as a gift. But if I had purchased it in the United States, it would be a, probably have been made by people who were making starvation wages in in third world country, in Bangladesh or India or someplace else, right? So our wealth, our ability to buy these clothing. And these materials are predicated on their poverty. Uh, so the next slide uh, is uh, brings together some quotations from uh, uh, these uh, critical social economists and world systems theorists it, to show it's it, to show that there's a consensus right among critical thinkers and so on. Uh, look at the third one, if you would, uh, this, uh, the Italian um, economist, uh, Scripanti. He says, the vastness of the U.S. economy has created a certain synergy between fiscal, monetary, and war policies so that the pursuit of each of these three functions has facilitated the realization of the others, right? It's another way of recognizing that military policy monetary policy and economic interest go together in this world system. He, uh, the U.S. as a center of today's empire uh, is a militarized nation state and its war policies are used to complement and promote the capitalist ideology and that is imposed worldwide. And to uh, gain control of markets, to uh, eliminate enemies who are rivals for markets, uh, and so on. Uh, the, uh, a number of uh, these uh, economists have criticized GDP, right? The gross domestic product, product as a standard for uh, nation state health, economic health and growth. The idea for for decades now has has uh, charts are published annually and semi annually uh, about the GDP, the growth of each of these nations, and and if their GDP is growing, it's considered to be a sign of economic health. And this is a, more, a, a growing chorus of economists have been pointing out that this is simply false. First of all, GDP. Uh, includes all economic activities, so even the, those that are addressing massive destruction. So, for example, when Hurricane Katrina destroyed New Orleans in the United States a few years ago, uh, the billions of dollars in in uh, wealth, the, the city itself was flooded and buildings were destroyed, infrastructure was destroyed. Billions of dollars were lost and had to be, it all had to be rebuilt. And uh, so this, this all went into the GDP of the United States. And, and so when that GDP is announced, it looks like the United States has progressed. It has gotten richer. It, is, it has had a more healthy economy, even though what has happened was a massive destruction and an attempt to rebuild. Uh, uh, wealth that was already there. So destruction uh, and recreation out of that destruction uh, uh, makes it look like there's health going on, but really it's just a process of uh, trying to deal with one disaster after another. 
it's not health, economic health. And it does not address poverty. It does not address uh, sustainability or, or the environment, right? Uh, uh, the growth in eco economics can be a growth in those things that destroy the environment. It's still part of GDP. It looks like something has, uh, has positive has happened when it really has, is negative. So, so uh, a number of economists have uh, exposed what's going on here. One of them is Richard Heinberg uh, in his book, The End of Growth. And this, on this slide, uh, it, it, there's a quote from Heinberg, which uh, uh, lays out the kind of economic system that we live in today. Uh, it's, uh, so the quote, at the bottom of the page there in black font says today most money is created by banks under the fractional reserve system which requires banks to keep on reserve a certain proportion of the money they lend to borrowers three percent for smaller banks ten percent for larger banks this means that a bank may lend up to 97 percent of whatever actual assets it possesses this loan account goes on the bank's balance sheet and exists nowhere else. It is a virtual asset to the bank, but a more real debt to the borrower, borrower who promises to repay the loan with interest. Uh, notice what the case is here, what, what is being said here. Money is created by fiat by banks, by private profit-making banks. Most money in the world today is created by fiat. So if a bank is a small bank with 3%, has to require 3% uh, reserve, it can loan up to 97%. It can, and so if I, if I ask for a loan of $1 million, right, that loan does not exist in, necessarily in the bank's reserves. It isn't that the bank has that money. What it does is simply write on the computer $1 million indebted to me, and it has created that money out of nowhere, out of nothing, just on paper. And of course, it, to me, since I've committed to pay this $1 million back with interest, the, the, the money has to be paid back. But the money is created out of nothing. Most money in the world is created in this way as debt. Uh, that's what that's what he is saying, and uh, and because it's created in this way as debt, the expectation is growth, right? The uh, that uh, unless I can flourish, use that one million dollars to invest in my business or whatever, and flourish and grow, I won't be able to pay back the principal as well as the interest. So growth is, is built into the system, the necessity for growth. But uh, Heinberg writes, you know, that uh, in this quote here, the, on this next slide, nations operate under a debt system in which they themselves borrow from the world banking system in order to invest in infrastructure and other initiatives with the expectation that growth measured in ever-increasing GDP will allow them to pay back the principal and interest on the loan. So nations do the same thing as people. I might borrow a million dollars, but uh, but Uganda might borrow, you know, uh, 500 million from the World Bank or the IMF. And the expectation is that Uganda will flourish, its economy will flourish, it will be able to pay back the principal as well as the interest on that debt. To the private, you know, the World Bank and the IMF are not public. They're private consortiums of private banks, right? The world does not have any public banking to speak of. Here and there, there's small instances of it, but most of it is private profit-making banks. So the, the requirement is, is uh, a requirement for growth. Right, and this growth does not have to be sustainable. In fact, I argue that it cannot be sustainable, right? If they're going to grow, uh, so uh, Heinberg, in the red font there, 
says that we've reached the, you know, we've reached the end of growth on this planet. You cannot grow indefinitely on a finite planet. Well, all of our resources on the planet are overtaxed now. And therefore, he says in the red font, the end of growth is the ultimate credit event. As everyone gradually comes to realize that there will be no surplus later to repay the interest on debt that is accruing now. Right? Which means that the system, the entire system of money creation on our planet has to be changed. Right? We can't have a money system where private banking creates money by fiat, expecting it to be paid back through growth if we want a sustainable development. The end of growth is here. We've got to change that system. So uh, uh, since the 1980s, uh, uh, environmentalists have been talking about overshoot that we on this planet are past the peak of, of, in many ways, the peak of what we can extract from the planet, the peak of what we can expect from the planet. And we've got to stop this growth obsession and uh, begin to uh, find out how we can live without growing and without money created as debt. So here on this the chart on the left-hand side of the uh, slide is uh, oil, peak oil. Uh, and you can see that peak oil, uh, the, uh, it shows that peak oil was achieved uh, uh, somewhere around 2008, right? July 2008 was the high. And each of the colors on this chart is oil produced by a different portion of the world. All right, so Gulf, the blue, the big blue swath is Gulf oil from Saudi Arabia and so on, and Iran. Uh, at the bottom, the yellow is uh, oil from the United States. And you can see oil coming from Texas oil wells and so on, peaked about 1970 and has been declining ever since. But everywhere, the oil uh, reserves are, are declining. Right, so we've re we've passed peak oil. We've passed peak food production. Right, peak food production requires a very fertile land, a, a, a ever increasing amount of land, and so on, because the world's population is increasing. But we we've passed that, uh, and uh, now that is declining. Right, P peak fr wa fresh water supplies long since we've passed that. Water is becoming scarce all over the planet. Peak agricultural land, like, agricultural land is disappearing. Peak forests, forests are disappearing around the planet. The peak regeneration capacity for the planetary ecosystem. What overshoot means, what unsustainably, sustainability, unsustainability means is that we're past the capacity of the planet to regenerate itself to sustain life on the planet. We've, we've passed that. We're now, we're now degrading just the very fact of living on this planet and with food, clothing, and shelter for, for uh, 7.8 billion people means that we are, are eating away at the uh, capacity of the planetary ecosystem to sustain life. So, and peak growth for the planet's economy is passed in the same way. So, uh, uh, let's go through quickly the 17 goals. Uh, the first goal, end poverty in all its forms everywhere. Right? Uh, how do you end that? Well, the dogma of, poverty, of capitalism, the dominant idea of capitalism was that poverty would be ended by growth, right? Uh, the slogan was, uh, a rising tide floats all boats, right? So either the poor, if the, if the growth is happening, even the poor will benefit. Uh, but one of the things that is left out, if you read these, uh, the detail, the whole of the um, Sustainable Development Goal document, the word population only appears three or four times, always in innocuous uses. 
They never talk about the population crisis. They never talk about the fact that the world adds 80 million new people to its population every year. Now, how are you going to achieve and the end of poverty? How are you going to achieve fresh water for everybody and sustainability for everybody? Uh, at the same time, you know, agricultural land is disappearing, as we've seen, and the population is increasing at the same time. More people, less land for food. How are you going to do that under the present situation? Uh, the, and there's, of course, there's a reason why the Sustainable Development Goal goals leave out population. The document is political, right? The document couldn't have, have been signed by 190 some countries if they had brought in political things that some countries objected to. And there are countries that object to concern for the population explosion. Right? One of them is the United States. It doesn't like want you to talk us to talk about that. It doesn't want us to talk about birth control or the liberation of women who through education about uh, about uh, birth control and so on. It's, these are non topics, and and these non topics didn't get into the document, and that means that the document is not will not be effective for achieving its goals. Uh, so that's what this current uh, slide says, and the uh, end hunger, how are you going to de do that under the model of endless growth and the model that ignores population? Goal three, healthy lives uh, promote well-being for all ages. And the example here is taken from Indonesia, but it's, it's, it's generalizable. This applies really to many countries around the world. Uh, in the top right, Indonesia is increasing its military and its military budget. So is India, so is China, so is Russia, so is Iran, so is the United States. They're all increasing their military budgets. And so it, it details the facts of that increase over a five-year period in Indonesia. At the same time, the GDP of Indonesia has been growing, the bottom right the GDP has been growing, but when GDP grows, and this is a common statistic, as it says here in the red font, only 20% of Indonesians benefited from the growing economic wealth during the last decade. 80%, the poor, the vast majority of the people, 205 million people did not benefit from that economic growth. The rich get richer, the poor stay poor or get poorer, the military budgets increase worldwide. How are you going to achieve the sustainable development goals if you don't change this system? But the amazing thing is, well, we'll as we'll see when we go on, the amazing thing is this also is not mentioned in the SDG document. So under the constitution, right, this different paradigm that we're offering, the constitution guarantees freedom from hunger, poverty, and lack of well-being, their rights. It's not just ideals, their rights that people have, legal rights. The institutions of the, of the Earth Federation government are designed to address the failures of the current world system. And the key, one of the keys, but certainly the major key, is the third point here, the world financial system under the Earth Constitution provides debt-free, interest-free money creation to supply the needs of humanity. Not money created as debt by private profit-making institutions, which is 99% of the, world, the way money is created in the world today. Money would be created by the world government for the purpose of addressing planetary problems in assist creating sustainability. Be debt-free, interest-free money. So uh, the uh, goal four, five, and six, education for everybody, gender equality, empowering women and girls, uh, ensuring availability of water, sustainable water management, 
Under the UN system, uh, the so-called rights to education and gender equality are up to each nation to enforce. So when the UN has a convention, right, convention on the rights of women or a convention on the rights of, uh, of uh, poor and so on, the, these conventions are just voluntary, right? They, everybody comes in and assigns it, and then it's up to each nation. And no nation is penalized if it does not live up to these rights. And naturally, they, they're, they're happy to sign, they're happy to look like they affirm these rights because there's no obligation to achieve them under the UN system. Uh, uh, and under the Earth Constitution, on the right-hand side, education, gender equality, clean water are universal enforceable legal rights for every person on Earth. And these achieving these is not the responsibility of individual countries. Naturally, since it's a federation, the countries will work together, but they will have a, a, a world federal government over all of them with a constitution that they're required to obey. So no country will be able to say, oh, we don't recognize the rights of our women and girls because uh, it's, it's part of the Earth Constitution, which supersedes the constitutions of each nation. So these, these rights are the responsibility of the Earth Federation as a whole. And again, you can see the principle. You've got, unless we unite as a whole, a real united whole under a single constitution, uh, the fragmentation of the world is going to result in failure of sustainability. Goal seven, uh, access to uh, sustainable, clean energy for all. But uh, Naomi Klein in her book, uh, Everything, This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate, uh, details the way big oil has spent hundreds of millions of dollars calling into question the conclusion of this climate scientist and uh, influencing legislatures throughout the world, including the United States legislature, not to take decisive action uh, to eliminate fossil fuel and so on. Uh, how are we going to deal with this, right? Do they, does freedom of speech mean you can say whatever you want? You can, you can call into uh, question scientific truths it's a big question. So uh, uh, goal eight, promote sustained, inclusive, uh, and sustainable economic growth. It's a contradiction in terms, as we've seen. You cannot have sustainable growth because growth on a finite planet is impossible. We've got to end the growth mantra and, and look at sustainability as, as eliminating the poverty of the world, eliminating the inequality of the world, eliminating the militarism of the world, that's all that is part of sustainability, but it cannot be growth. Right? Uh, um, even elementary theories of capitalism recognize that profit margins require unemployment. Right? This uh, goal eight says we need product, full employment for everybody, but under capitalism, the profit is made because you have desperate people, an underclass of people, an unemployment rate of 7% or 10% of people who need those jobs so they can be hired at minimum wages in order to make a profit for the enterprise, right? Well, if the uh, full employment cannot happen. Uh, and we've seen that growth cannot be part of uh, sustainability. So goal nine, build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive, sustainable industrialization, foster innovation. Uh, this, these sound very good. Innovation is good in uh, sustainable industrialization, whatever that means, clean industry, clean energy, all this is good. But uh, under the World Trade Organization, for example, there are dozens of pages in the, uh, dedicated to intellectual property rights that ensure the profiteering of multinational corporations 
in ways that defeat technology transfer, pharma pharmaceutical transfer, open source information. So under the private property regime and the profit regime of the multi of the world and the multinational corporations, their their idea and their technology and so on are private are designed for private profit, not for creating sustainable and equitable development for everybody. So this is the world system, you know, and the SDGs never que question that world system. The global public banking, uh, that is banking that is debt free and interest free and, uh, and is, is dedicated to human welfare and rather than private profit, that's the key to uh, creating sustainability. Okay, goal 10, reduce inequality. Uh, the, the same uh, irony re exists because under the nation state system, uh, the UN charter says all the nations are sovereignly equal, the equal sovereign entities. But the UN is not a government, it cannot enforce anything, so it recognizes a sovereign fragmentation. Each one is so supposed to be sovereign and equal, but if, if there's no law over all of them to enforce that, that means in practice, the big ones will dominate. The big ones will act as rogues. They'll do what they want. China, Russia, the US, right? Uh, all these uh, antagonisms between countries, Pakistan, India, they cannot be stopped because there's no, there's no overall authority to uh, give us the rule of law. So under the Earth Constitution, all nations are equal under enforceable world law. And even though the big nations with more people have more representation in the parliament, none of this invasions and coup d'etat and uh, 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 secret arrangements and uh, uh, blockades, none of that can happen. It all violates world law. So, you know, here's the capitalist linear model, extraction from the ground and so on uh, of uh, materials, uh, um, the, uh, does not take into account the externalities, right? They, if you, uh, uh, mobile oil makes more profit if it, if it rapes the uh, jungles of Ecuador looking for oil, than if it is trying to be very ecologically careful in those jungles of Ecuador. Its, pro its profit is externalized. Same with production. When a factory has a smokestack and it burns uh, its energy and out of that comes smoke, right? That smoke is an externality onto the earth, to the people of earth. The profit made by that, pro pro uh, that uh, uh, production facility, uh, part of that profit is externalized into the atmosphere and environment of the earth. It's made at the expense of the people of earth. Same with consumption, throw away plastic, whatever's cheapest and so on, that's made at the expense of the environment. And disposal, the cheaper the disposal, the better. All kinds of disposal problems, top, toxic waste is being dumped by multinational corporations around the world because it's very expensive to clean up toxic waste. Under this, the capital, under this model, this linear model, it cannot happen, right? Sustainability cannot happen. The SDGs do not question that model. So a circular economy, it has to be one that's not based on private profit. It has to be extraction has to be kept at a minimum, not a maximum, a minimum. You don't want to grow your extraction, right? That's too much extraction already. Manufacture for dur must be for durability and reusability. They could make cars that would last 50 years. They could make uh, a, a vacuum cleaner that would last 30 years. Right, but they don't. They build them to fall apart just after the warranty is is expired. If the warranty is one year, it falls apart in twelve months, in fourteen months, or whatever. Uh, and uh, that has to that has to change. You can't have 
uh, uh, manufacturing for private profit, you have to have manufacturing for durability uh, for people. The same with a, a consumption. Consumption cannot be a consumer economy where people find uh, the culture of consuming more and more and throw away, uh, can't have throwaway products. You can't have this waste of resources. Every, every one of us has a waste basket in our house and we, we put these, uh, this trash in this wastebasket and, and the amount of trash that we put in there is probably 50 times what needs, what actually needs to be put in there. But we live in a, a waste generating because that's what makes profit for the manufacturers is, is creating things to be thrown out, to be wasted. And the same thing with, uh, uh, heat and waste, uh, put into the environment and it has to be an absolute minimum. That's what sustainability is about. And without that, the SDGs will not succeed. All right? So uh, they uh, goal 13, we must take urgent action to combat climate change and its impact. But what I've already mentioned to you is that uh, the, their urgent action is not really it. It's not sufficient. They say we must, uh, they must affirm the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is simply a framework on, on, uh, uh, that presupposes the private banking, the private uh, um, uh, sovereignty, uh, presupposes the same world order that is the cause of these problems. So, uh, Goal 14, conserve the oceans. Well, uh, the goal 14 says uh, nations must conform to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which provides legal framework for protecting the oceans. But it's not enforceable, right? Nations are sovereign. You can't enforce law over them under the current system. So the Japanese, for example, are destroying whales around the world, killing whales, depleting the whale population, and no one can stop them from doing that. Uh, uh, and uh, on the other hand, the Earth Constitution in Article 4.23 says that the oceans belong to the people of Earth. Right? They're not just this commons where everybody, every sovereign nation can do what they want on them, but they belong to the people of Earth. And so by law, the oceans can and should be protected. Right? Uh, goal 15, restore and promote sustainable use of ecosystems, manage forests, combat desertification, halt and reverse land de de degradation, and halt biodiversity loss. How are you going to do all those things? Uh, the, uh, the key in, in the SDG document, article number 18 states, we affirm that every state has and shall freely exercise full permanent sovereignty over all its wealth, natural resources, and economic activity. See, that principle at the heart of the SDGs, they affirm that every state, right? That, that means that we will not be able to succeed. That means, for example, that Brazil, where the lungs of the earth exist, Brazil has the legal right to destroy the lungs of the earth. Right, the legal right. Every state has complete sovereignty over all its wealth and natural resources, but the natural resources of the earth are there for all of us because the earth is a giant ecosystem. The 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 rainforests in Brazil belong to the people of Earth because it produces most of the oxygen that we need worldwide to breathe. But Brazil, under the current system, has the legal right to destroy those lungs, and it's doing so right now under its new conservative government, selling off the lungs of the earth. The same with every nation, right? This is, under this principle, you cannot have sustainability. So by contrast, Article 4 of the Earth Constitution uh, gives the uh, Earth Federation, as you can see, the power to conserve, regulate all the natural resources that are needed for everybody, to control population and respect to the life capacities of the earth, to conserve the water supplies of the earth, to own and protect the oceans of the earth, 
to own and protect the atmosphere of the earth, right? This atmosphere, China right now producing CO2 and pouring it into the atmosphere because of its industrialization, right? That atmosphere travels around the earth. They're polluting, they're sending all this CO2 into the atmosphere, but it's not Chinese atmosphere, it's the earth's atmosphere that circulates everywhere. What right do they have to do that? Under the current system, they have an absolute legal right to do that. So goal 16, promote peaceful and inclusive societies. And this is where I mentioned before, the SDG document not only does not mention population of the world, the population explosion, but it does not mention global militarism, right? Well, this uh, goal 16 is talking about internal peace within these nations. You should be peaceful and inclusive within your nation. It never mentions $1.8 trillion spent in the year 2020 on militarism worldwide. Spying, wars, endless, endless competition, arms races, nuclear weapons, massive social displacement, millions of refugees, never mentions any of that, right? It's a document that is formulated to politically modify or mollify the most powerful nations that have signed that document, right? Yeah. And, uh, and we can see the this pie chart here gives the uh, proportion of the military that's spent by the nations. The Global Imperial Center, the United States spends almost uh, equivalent to the rest of the nations combined because it, it its military, militarism protects the world system. It's the imperial center of the world system right now. You got to change that system if you want sustainability. So just three more slides left. Uh, goal 17, uh, the last one, strengthen the means of implementation and revitalize the partnership. But this partnership uh, assumes the present world system, which is the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, ECOSOC, the World Trade Organization, and all of these, as we've seen during this presentation, are destructive. Uh, uh, they're predicated on growth. They're destructive of the environment. They, they uh, per, uh, perpetuate poverty in the global south and wealth in the global north. And so under this uh, partnership that they talk about, the goals cannot be achieved. Yeah, that will just continue. The, this is the system responsible for the mess we're in now, and it will just continue. So all of this is summed up in this chart, the second last chart here, uh, that, that emphasizes the difference between the Earth Constitution and the current system. Whether to spend immense resources to militarize for war, that's up to each nation. Right? There's no law over the nations that say you can't do this whether to protect universal human rights, up to each nation, right? If Burma wants to uh, uh, persecute the Rohingya people, no, nothing anybody can do about it because it's up to each nation whether they protect human rights or not. Whether to uh, cooperate with others in protecting the oceans, up to each nation. Whether to protect the planetary atmosphere, it's under the control of each nation. The water circulating through each nation under the control of the nation. Forests, like the lungs of the earth in Brazil, under the control of each nation. Internal toxic waste and pollution inevitably spreads around the earth under the control of each nation. Fresh water flowing from the glaciers. Right? They say the Himalayas, within 50 years, the glaciers will be gone and the people in northern India and Bangladesh and so on will be without fresh water. It's under the control of, of the nations where those, where those uh, mountains exist, right? There's no authority that says this water must be preserved, or protected, or the, these people must have fresh water. The same with rivers flowing through multiple countries under the control of the nations where the rivers are. And the finances necessary to transform to sustainability well, they're under the control of the World Bank and the IMF and these private pro profit-making banking systems. 
how are we going to have sustainability? Poor countries exploited by rich countries and banking and their cheap labor resources and repayment of loans under the control of the imperial nations, global banking and multinational corporations. So for each of these items, the world, uh, the Earth Constitution puts them under control of the people of Earth, not the individual nations. Okay, last slide, just a summary. Uh, the SDGs, number one, they entirely ignore the global population. Number two, they ignore the vast expenditures of military on endless militarism and arms races. Number three, they ignored the global north-south domination framework where their poverty and the wealth of the, na of the northern nations are interdependent. Number four, the whole thing is predicated on the capitalist endless growth model. Number five, they really fail to achieve any kind of integral holism of humanity that is necessary for success. And that's exactly what the Earth Constitution does is, is give us that holism. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for your attention. Uh, and I'd be happy to have questions if, if people want to ask yeah. questions.